Hello, everyone, and welcome to Tuesdays with BOA. My name is Dan Hurd. I'm the director of adult programs at Writers and Books. Writers and Books is a nonprofit literary arts center in Rochester, New York. We offer readings, workshops, and literary programming for people of all ages. For more information about our upcoming events, our website is wab.org. We're so happy to partner with BOA Editions to bring you this series. First, we're here, we'll hear from Alana, then she'll be in conversation with the publisher of BOA Editions, Peter Connors. If you have a question, feel free to submit it with the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Alana Bell's poet, debut poetry collection, Eyes Stone, was selected by Fanny Howe as winner of the 2011 Walt Whitman Award from the Academy of American Poets. Her writing has appeared in Harvard Review, Massachusetts Review, Agni, Barrow Street, and elsewhere. Alana currently teaches poetry at the Juilliard School and sings with the Resistance Revival Course. Her new book, Mother Country, examines the intricacies of mother-daughter relationships, what we inherit, what we let go, what we hold, and what we pass to our children, both visible and invisible. Mother Country is now available through our bookstore, Ampersand Books. I'll send out the link. Alana is also teaching a writing workshop on October 17th. I will share that as well. Um, please welcome Alana Bell. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Dan, and writers and books. I'm really excited to be here on the actual birthday, the publication day of Mother Country. So thank you for having me. Miracle. What else to call the way the bare branches I bought at the neighborhood bodega came back to life that winter? I carried them home, dry, wrapped in paper, stuck them in the square vase, and as an afterthought, filled it with water. I don't know when I noticed the pale pink shoots sprouting from the submerged ends, wild, reaching roots like ginseng or the hair on an old woman's chin. Then tiny green leaves began to appear at the tips, curling over themselves with the sheer effort of growing. I thought they were dead. And now I recall being in the grip of a darkness I did not have a name for and didn't think I'd survive. I could try to describe it for you now. The nights I woke with my pulse pounding through the heaviness of each breath, how the effort of being inside my body felt like burning. What I really want to tell you is this, how in the parch of that long drought, the people I loved kept bringing me water, water, Though I turned my back and did not answer to my name, though I flung the cup away, let me say it plain, I wanted to die. But something in me, some tiny bulb still alive under all that rotted wood, kept drinking, kept right on drinking. So um, as Dan, share the poems in this collection, address my mother, my relationship with my mother and her illness, both uh, Parkinson's early onset as well as uh, mental illness. And there was a point in my own life where I experienced quite a serious depression, which is what I'm referencing here. Um, but this sort of question that I wrestle with in this book, or one of the questions, um, is, is what is it to grieve for someone who is still living? And um, when I was in my early 20s, as I mentioned, my mother suffered a um, post, uh, excuse me, a premenopausal depression. Um, and I had to take her to the electroconvulsive therapy ward, which is a shock treatment. So this poem is about that. Dropping my mother off at the electroconvulsive therapy ward. Do I look strange, she asks. The other patients with their flyaway hair and unblinking eyes wander the floor. You look like a movie star. The nurses suggest I get some air. Her eyes widen as I edge toward the door, leaving her in gloved hands quick for a cure. 
As a girl, I followed her down any steep or muddied path. I catch my face in the sharp fluorescence of the bathroom mirror. Have my dark eyes darkened? Was that shadow there before? Who will I follow when she is gone? When they wheel her back to me, faint bloom of urine on her gown. What happened in that room while I drank coffee just outside the door? Mother, I've done what you would never do. Walked you to the edge, then turned away. Blackout, New York City, 2003. My mother calls to tell me it's her fault. Her black, black thoughts, the cause of this city gone dark. Each window, a blank eye in the stone. The lost bodies below swarming hot concrete. Black as Hitler, she whispers through the wire. And the steam rises from a grate in the street. I tell her how last night on our block, folks gave away beer and ice cream and all the meat they couldn't cook. And for the first time in years, the Milky Way was visible. I did that, she asks. Elegy for Mother, Still Living. And the epigraph is by Jack Gilbert. The Lord gives everything and charges by taking it back. I was formed inside the body of a woman who wanted me as she wanted her own life, allowed to drink the milk made only for me. I was given mother love, its bounty and its cocoon of those first years without language. It is right to mourn the rocky hills of Crete where we walked my small hand in hers for hours. The hidden beach where we swam naked then baked on the fine sand. Lazy afternoons in her lap, her thick hand stroking my curls. Her fingers have stiffened. Her eyes, the eyes of an animal in pain. I hold my mother against the woman she is. So um, fast forward to my own journey uh, toward becoming a mother, which, you know, among other things, uh, was fraught with a challenging fertility journey. So this poem is called First Intrauterine, excuse me, First Intrauterine Insemination. It was not making love, but we held hand, hands anyway and looked into each other's eyes and not at the gloved hands as the tube went in. Alone in the cold room, I rest with my feet in the air and picture the light entering my body. I name it Surya, meaning sun. There's a storm coming. Soon this whole city will fill with white, a blank field. I will go out into the morning before the plows, out into the thick quiet and crouch, letting the dark fluid spill out of me to mark the baby that did not come. I will bury it like an animal. This time, I do not give it a name. All month, the blood collected in my uterus as if in a bowl. It drains out slowly, staining the hotel robe with my body's rust. This time, the blizzard does not surprise. Through the window, I watch snow swirl and cover the tops of buildings, the slick black street below. Nothing is new, not this storm, not my blood, not these words. Letter to my son in utero. You are not the first. Before you, 
another seed took hold. And every morning your father rubbed my belly in wonder at what she would become. When the doctor said, no heartbeat, the air went out of me. My dead body, excuse me, my dead baby, I thought. They would not call it that. Embryo, 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 they said. A padded word meant to keep me from what I knew. Something had lived its, in me its whole small life and was gone. Forgive me for loving another before you. Forgive me also the weight of my love for you, already heavy with death. Forgive me, I am a Jew. In the middle of the celebration, I always smash the glass. And this poem is about the calling for my son. Invocation for my unborn. Little bird, little invisible, do you feel the pull of my silent song? Little bird, little beating heart, I cup my hands to make a world for you. Come, come, little one, yes, I call for you out loud without shame. Again, I open to the tide of tiny swimmers and pray one reaches center. I've made my heart into a bowl for you, hungry teacher, little grower from between the worlds. I call you with all my breath and muscle, with this body made to fill with you. I call you from my tunneled center, my millions of eggs, any of which could be you. Call with my blood river, my throat and fat hands with cooking spoon and iron pan. Little one, little bird I feed with my mouth, particle grown from seed, treasure, little mystery, little all the names I do not know, little you I cannot find in all my folds, little second heartbeat I swear I hear when I stand at the shore. Little all the names I've named you in my second tongue, and all your names mean light. Little stranger, greedy bee, your absent wings tickle my womb. Little rib formed from my rib, little sexless fish in dark waters, little anchor tossed from the wooden boat of our loving. Little poem I do not have the words for. Little incantation, come, come, through the sea that knows your names, through black night with its stars for eyes, through the wind and all its directions. Let it blow you home. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lana. That was beautiful. And congratulations on the publication of Mother Country, which I'm so <laughs> thrilled that Boa published. And I was thinking about first reading this manuscript and I had not been familiar with your work and, um, and, and it was sent during an open submission period. And there was, well, I, I don't know, I was reading 120 or 130 manuscripts and I just remember yours just being so clearly um, rising to the top and also just feeling so much like a Boa Editions book that I'm just so pleased to come full circle with that and welcome you here tonight. And I was thinking about the poem Afterbirth, the long poem that closes the book. And um, that's, that's one I was particularly taken with and I think it really just adds such a nice finish to the book. And there's a line in there that says, when I said I wanted a child, it was in the abstract. <laughs> Having a child is not abstract. <laughs> and, and I thought, you know, that really sums up a lot to me of, of that sort of the hard realities that can come with parenting. And I wonder if you could talk some about how that particular line, having a child is not abstract, relates to mother country. Sure. <laughs> well, and it's funny, I, you know, I was gonna, I am gonna, I, I we'll close with a poem and, and it's a poem uh, called Prayer actually, which is very much about kind of the realities, the sort of hard and fast and bodily realities of having a child. You know, I kind of think of it the way, 
before I got married, um, there was all this like excitement about the wedding. And it was like, <laughs> I put so much like into the wedding. It was like the dress and, and, not, and, and not just the, like I'm a ritualist. So like the ritual and the prayers and the vows and the, all the things. And then it was like, there's marriage, which is like wonderful and really hard work, you know? And like, and it's, it's forever. It's like, I mean, we're not for everybody. It's not for everybody, but it's a, it's a long term commitment. You hope, right. That's your, that was that's most people's attention. I think when they choose to, to get married. And so that feeling of just like, and I, so the child was the same thing. It was like, and I, I lived in Park Slope for um, many years and was around a lot of like super well-educated natural birth advocates and like, you know, people just like having all of this, like, so it was like, I did all the same things about the birth. It was like, I made my birth plan and I got a doula and I like wanted a water birth. By the way, I ended up having a cesarean, like none of it went according to plan, but it, it's just like, then there's the child and like the reality of having a child, there is nothing to prepare you for it. There is nothing. It's like, there's no abstraction about it. It's like so real and so present. And so like, you know, all of it. I mean, and when people ask, like, I've had people say, like, who are, don't have children, like, do you regret having a child now that you know how hard it is? And I say, I don't regret, I love, I don't regret my son. I love my son beyond measure. I'm extremely ambivalent about motherhood, like the institution and like what it requires of me, but there's no, my son is not a question. It's like, and um, I don't know if I've answered your question. I feel like I might've moved away more into the personal, but I, yeah. So, and I've said to people also that like, for me, being a parent or being a mother has brought me, like, it has brought me the greatest joys, like, that, like a particular quality of, like, something that I, I don't imagine I would feel with anything else. It has also brought me the, like, the lowest lows, feeling the shittiest I am about myself as a human being, like, all of that. So, you know, I think the book was, is in part, it's like the longing for the child and then wrestling with the nuances of being a mother and the way that there isn't or hasn't been, I think there is more now, but a lot of space to really be honest about that, to really be honest about the ambivalence of the institution of motherhood, you know, and fatherhood too, but I think motherhood has a particular cultural sort of stereotype or like expectation. Yeah, I mean, honestly, that answer, I'm sitting here listening like, this is what I fell in love with with mother country. There's that sort of beautiful, radical, you know, honesty about the situation that I, I found really and, and continue to find really um, refreshing and, and eye-opening and just, you know, kind of fascinating. And, um, you know, I also am really fascinated by your work outside of poetry as a sound practitioner, creative alchemist. And there's a line that I've seen on your Instagram and I've seen on your website. And it is, I believe that creative energy is healing energy. And I, I would love to hear you sort of expand more on that concept and also talk some about how that work overlaps with your poetry writing. Sure, so um, in my work with, so I've been a, a facilitator and a teacher as long as I've been a writer. Um, since I was 15, I was like teaching theater to kids. And, you know, so in, in addition to having my own create, and I grew up with parents who are both educators. So I've always been involved in like, not only having my own creative practice, but sharing that and being in circle and in relationship with other people. And what I have seen again and again, both for myself and for the people I work with, my students, my clients, um, is this, what happens in the creative process, it's an alchemical process. So there's like, you have an experience, which can be, uh, it can be joyful, it can be you know, a lived experience, or you have an emotional experience. And then through the alchemical, I call it an alchemical process, through the alchemical creative process, something happens to that experience. There's a, it changes. Um, and it no longer is just um, painful or whatever it was. It becomes, it gives, there's like a meaning that comes to it. Um, I've, I work with a lot of victims, uh, excuse me, survivors of um, sexual abuse and trauma, or people who have suffered, um, you know, racism, or like, you know, many, many other things, or massage any 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 isms or any just like the hardness of being a human like i've worked with people you know and i taught for um 15 years teaching young people in the south bronx who were extremely marginalized in many ways and watching again and again as they went through this process of using their creative energy and and bringing their voices forward and and feeling empowered by that experience and feeling changed by that experience and it doesn't take away you know the suffering that they had or 
you know, it, you would never wish that on yourself so that you could write a poem about it, you understand? But, but there's something in the claiming of it, in the sharing of the story, um, in the belief in your own voice that I think is extremely healing. Um, so that's one piece of it. And the other piece, as you mentioned, so I don't just work with writing. And when I teach, I really teach from a philosophy of embodied creativity. So I think um, many of us, our creative impulse got stifled or diminished in school settings because it got sort of, or, or even like in the marketplace, like funneled into like, you know, how can I make this marketable? Or, you know, is this good according to whose idea of good, you know, according to what I'm learning in school. And so a lot of the work I do with clients and students is really about kind of undoing that sort of inner critic and like really, so we do a lot of work with sound and movement um, and other practices to bring people into their body so that the work is coming from that place. Um, and in terms of my own journey and the writing of this book, I mean, um, when I first had my son, you know, all jokes aside, the, the identity shock was quite intense for me. And I did suffer some, I didn't, I wouldn't say that I went into a full fledged postpartum depression, but it was like a major identity crisis. And my, I had a lot of anxiety and mild depression and my own practices, both in fact, that long poem that you mentioned um, was actually, it was the first time that I, was, I wrote a poem in a phone. It was like, I've always worked longhand. I never work on the computer first. I always write. And I'm, my best work used to come from these month long residencies. So I'd go away to like Vermont or like, you know, upstate New York and someone was cooking for me and I didn't have to worry about my husband or any of my, like, and, and I would produce like more than I ever did. But in this very, like, I would, authentic, my kind of pace. It was like not, and then suddenly my whole life, I was like, well, if I, and depending on that, I'll just never write a poem again because I have like two seconds here or four minutes here. And so I would just like start, I type, it was called the mommy journal initially. And I would just, whenever I'd have a thought or an image or an experience, I would just type it in. Now, obviously the final version had a lot of revisions and moving things around and whatever, but the basic seed and not just seed, but a lot of that poem, that was my practice during when I had my son. And that, and also actually, when I had my son was when I really began my sound healing practice starting on myself. And then I it became something I shared with others. That's wonderful. I want to um, read a question that was sent in. Um, this is from Allison Myers, executive director of Writers and Books. Hi, Hi Allison. Allison. <laughs> um, she says, have women poets like Sexton and Oles who broke taboos against writing about the female body influenced you or given you permission? Absolutely. Um, so Anne Sexton was the first poet, um, that I read in college where I was like, oh, that's me. Like, like, the, I mean, not that's me, but there's, there's somebody who, who's understanding me. Like I felt it, it was particularly her first, uh, her poem for John who begs me not to inquire further, um, which was written in response to her workshop teacher telling her that her poetry was too, um, you know, whatever, it was talking about subjects that were not really subjects that were meant for poetry. And she, it was about her mental illness. And she wrote about that. And that poem, I love that poem. If I had it now, I would read it. Um, and so that was like the first time where I was like, oh, this is for me. And, um, and Sharon Olds is absolutely another poet that I love and go to again, you know, for poems about sex and the body and motherhood and fluids and like things that, you know, you, you were told were not um, the subject of, of poetry. Um, another poet who's given me permission, I would say, is uh, Lucille Clifton, just in terms like of the like the brevity, like some of her, I don't, I'm not particularly, I don't write necessarily super short poems, some of them are, but more just like that sense of the immediacy and like just being able to say it, you know. Um, so all of those poets have been big influences and I feel like um, really stepping in this book, my first book, I didn't have a child when it was written, so I feel like now I am joining like I'm a baby on the shoulders of like the many giants of the mother poets you know like to be in that company um is really powerful yeah because all of those poets that you named are also were also mothers I could chat with you all night long and <laughs> we were talking about earlier there were all these plans for you to come to Rochester and do workshops and everything and then that obviously got sidelined but we're absolutely going to have you to Rochester as soon as we can and continue this chat 
And um, I feel like too, honestly, it's it, people who, who love this chat will absolutely love Mother Country because there's so much of what we discussed in there. So I'm going to say good night and I'm going to say thank you and I'm gonna leave so that you can read one final poem from everyone. And um, thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Thank you so much, Peter and Dan. This has been a true honor. And I, I just have to say that like BOA has always been my dream. Like it was my dream. Like it was like that far away. Like if I could ever be published by a press that I really wanted, it was BOA because so many of the poets that I love, including my mentor, Laurent Baslar and you know Naomi Shihab Nye and Araceli Skirmai, like Lucille Clifton, like these poets, I just feel so honored to be um, and humbled to be in that company. So thank you so much for your belief in this book. So I am gonna read this poem, um, Prayer, which I hope, I think you'll appreciate given the, uh, the, the things we just said about the reality of motherhood, um, the bodily reality. Prayer. When you are crying and I don't know why, when I cannot soothe or quiet you, when my nipples are sore and cracked from your merciless mouth, or when you refuse the breast, when I finger the purple stretch marks across my thighs and belly, the loose skin, the blood vessels burst around my eyes and cheeks and asshole, which are because you are. When I stink of puke and milk and shit, when I begin to lose my grown up words from lack of use, when you push the cup of blended yams I've just prepared on the floor for the third time this week, and it isn't an accident because you looked right at me before you sent it over the edge of your high chair. When I am on my knees before you, little ruler, begging you to eat, to sleep, to piss in the bowl, let me remember those many nights on my knees, praying to another God, begging for you to come, for life to take hold inside of me and bloom. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dan, writers and books. Thank you, Peter. Thank you everyone for coming and listening and offering your beautiful questions. And it was lovely, lovely to be here. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. <laughs>